Time now for this week's Health Matters. Paul Kritz with you along with physician assistant Lynn Zabo. And uh, uh, we're talking about something that I'm currently engaged in, in screenings, all manner of screenings. Yeah, but this is kind of targeted screening and risk management. Okay. So risk calculators. I'm kind of obsessed with them lately. And um, How does that differ from uh, screening as, as what I used it for? Well, I assume you mean like you're getting your cholesterol done and yeah. that's your screen. Right. No, this is more targeted about a specific disease usually. Okay. So, and we did yours already. Um, we kind of did yours, the American Heart Association Risk Calculator. We talked about it on the air a little bit. Um, so that's the one that I use the most, but I, I got curious and there's all kinds of cool ones that I think people should know about because... Some of these are patient-driven, some are provider tools, mm -hmm. and um, I think they give great insights into how people can stay healthy, because what you're really looking for is modifiable risk, right? Right, right. And if, <clears throat> if you fix all the modifiable risk that you can, and you still have a high risk of a disease, then you target your screening. Okay, I got you. Yeah. All right, sort of so, eliminating the, right. the paths to uh, to, to getting right. to information. Okay. So, so that, like we just kind of insinuated, a health risk is the chance that something will harm your health. Okay. And um, these tools, and there's probably hundreds of them, don't really predict the future with certainty because they're also evolving tools, right? Mm -hmm. They're not perfect tools. Um, but they do suggest possibilities based on um, personal medical history and family history. Like statistical like, like possibilities, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, sure. Right, and I assume that the people that created the tools um, also keep looking at their usefulness and as new information comes up, mm -hmm. you know, like a new screening test, and they're gonna incorporate that. So right, right. they're developing um, risk calculators, or even I guess new understandings of, of what mm -hmm. the what the the genetic risks might be yeah, if something totally. is downplayed or changes, you know, in, in estimation, then that might adjust the tool too. Right, exactly. So <clears throat> it gives what it gives is the patient and a provider um, an idea of what could happen, what's likely to happen in a medical situation, and but the super cool thing, this is what. I'm kind of obsessed with right now is it gives you an idea of how the risk can be modified mm -hmm. to improve your um, health status in the future. Right. So that because yeah. you can change the parameters you input and then right. see the actual like well, right. the statistical so, change. Yeah. There's two two kinds of risk factors in general, modifiable ones and not modifiable mm -hmm. ones. Like my age is my age is my age. Right. Right. It's not going to change. But whether I choose to smoke or not, you know, is yeah. a change. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I mean by modifiable. And then, you, you know, I suppose you could, let's say you're not super interested in, you know, quitting smoking, for example, <laughs> then you could see what else you could do, maybe an improvement. To make up chances. for things a yeah. little? Okay. Like, how can you fudge it? <laughs> but some of these are medically complex and best used for the provider. And those are things like I imagine would be used by specialty um, providers in situations like hospitalization, for example, or cancer treatment, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. stuff like that. But there's numerous ones online that Joe Average can can just plug into and then kind of better understand what the important factors are that create a, a, a health future for somebody. Okay. Okay. And I, like I mentioned recently, we looked at the American Health Association one a couple months ago. The and American in family practice, that's the most common. Do you mean, <clears throat> did you mean the American Heart Association? Yeah, sure. Okay. I like health association, yeah, too. It, yeah. it could be all kinds oh, of things. Yeah, typo. <laughs> <clears throat> American Heart Association. But one of those specific typos that your AI smart I device know. won't catch, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> that's the universe playing with us. Um, <clears throat> so... I've got two specific ones that, I, that are more patient-driven and I think kind of helpful. So the these are apps that show up on phones. Mm -hmm. These are apps I have on my phone, actually. Um, and they're free and you can download. But I, I use it as a provider with a patient. You can just Google it and... Um, you know, get it online. So the first one is Breast Cancer Surveillance Surveillance Consortium Risk Calculator. Okay. That's a lot. That is. Which estimates the five and ten year risk of breast cancer 
and other breast diseases in women, specifically, now there's parameters for this, mm-hmm. right? Specifically women who are age 35 to 74. And this is kind of the downside of this. At a certain point, you age out of anybody caring. That's, yeah. <laughs> it's not that the, the, the risk changes for you. It's just like, ah, well, yeah, you're 75, like, you know. It's, yeah, it's a race to the finish line <laughs> then, right? <laughs> you're right, exactly. <laughs> Who really cares how you get there? Oh, my God. <clears throat> anyway, that's kind of sad. That is. It is. This tool specifically for women aged 35 to 74 and not for women with a previous diagnosis of breast cancer. Uh-huh. Or previous breast augmentation surgery, because okay. that apparently changed its your risk. It looks specifically at age, race and ethnicity, family history, history of previous biopsy, and a measure of breast tissue density. And, and a woman could figure that out by looking at a copy of a previous mammogram, because they always comment on it. So a history of previous biopsy, that, that just mean that you were afraid of it in the past and had somebody look at it and the doctor said, hey, we should check this you out? You had something that, that needed either something on mammogram or something on exam that needed to it'd be explained better. So it's so not so much a biopsy. So yeah, yeah, it's not so much the results of that biopsy, but just that you right. felt one was necessary. So, and what that means is actually your risk of previous biopsy, even if it was benign, kind of ups your future risk really i don't know why huh yeah huh. maybe it's just because you had something that was you know um suspicious enough i don't know that's weird <clears throat> the other thing i didn't put in here too is oftentimes they ask when you had your first baby mm-hmm. so age of first pregnancy is a huge big deal that's personally what up my risk because i had my kids older my oh first. so is it older pregnancies that right older okay. pregnancies um you know, you increase your risk of breast cancer a little huh. bit. Yeah. So this is probably best gone over with your doctor, but it, you could totally find it online and get an idea. So when I did it, my, my risk is slightly higher, only slightly higher than average for my age group. Mm-hmm. I remember risk changes with age because um, cancer is more likely as you, as you age into it. So my risk was like 3.2%. And um, 3.2% over average? Is that no, how you would read that? No, average is 2.2%. So oh, okay. mine is about a 1% increased risk, gotcha. mostly because I had my kids. Because it's the other thing I do is I, I go, you okay. change things well, and see? What if I had that kid at 23? <laughs> what would happen? <laughs> so is it, was, it, was it a risk over, over a certain time frame? Yeah, it's over 30, I think. No, no, no. I mean, for you looking forward, like uh, yeah. you've got like a... Uh, oh, yeah, it's five years and 10 years. Gotcha. That's what okay. you mean. That's what yeah. I mean. Yeah. yeah. So I I thought it was super interesting and that might change because right now there's two sets of recommendations about annual um, screening mammograms and mm-hmm. one is every other year and one is every year. Right, right. So, in, and that's radiation, right? So... And it, especially if you go up and get the the one in Brookings, that's the higher density one. What they don't say is that's more radiation. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 my personal decision here was, do I want to go to Brookings? Is that worth it for me? It turned out it wasn't. Mm-hmm. So I stayed local. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was helpful to me, too. Um, <clears throat> and the next one is, I don't know what... SWOP, I assume it's Dutch because this was developed in in uh, Dutch land. Uh, <laughs> whoops. Um, Dutchville. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, Rotterdam, I see. Okay, yeah. okay. So SWOP, prostate cancer risk Swoop. calculator. Yeah. <laughs> so and if you Google SWOP, you do not get it. So SWOP, pros- prostate cancer, which is available online. Now, this... This is a cool thing because this is something I would use in practice because uh-huh. the decision to get a PSA right now is kind of cloudy. You know, we we told all these men to get it, and then we said, well, it's not really important unless you actually have prostate cancer. And oh, you're wow. monitoring either treatment result or um, how you, if you're doing watchful waiting, which mm-hmm. is a legitimate way of addressing prostate cancer in some men, um, you know that. How do you know when you have to go from watchful waiting to actual more active treatment? Gotcha. Um, so PSAs were not used for a long time as routine screening, and now it's kind of suggested maybe that we should be doing that, but that's mostly because we don't have better alternative. Mm-hmm. What we need is a better alternative. But if you stratify your risk, okay, um, 
<clears throat> you know, the patient can do it directly or the providers. And there's seven different risk calculators total, but two are designed directly for patient use. And so I think some of the seven are used medically to decide like when you go from watch waiting to active treatment or when you change therapies or when you consider solely chemo versus chemo and surgery versus solely surgery. Right, right, you know, right. Stuff like that. It gets kind of complicated. And those more complicated risk calculators actually require information that, um, you know, the patient might not really have that available mm -hmm. to themselves. Um, but they can do the online ones, and they're super easy to use. I'm curious about this having being having a prostate having myself. A prostate, yeah. Uh, just to, about to, is there a way to tell if you're looking at the if seven if you get seven results? There's a way to tell which ones are are, are patient friendly. Yeah, they wouldn't be asking you questions. You have no idea about the answer. They oh, would. But no, I they, meant they'd just, be saying, like, I mean what's from your the, age? I mean from the Google page when you look at the. Yeah, yeah, they're identified. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. That's what. Yeah. Yeah. So they um, they address. Things like when should you have initial screening if mm -hmm. you have a high family history? Is that a reason to start screening earlier? And um, like I said, what what kind of treatment if you actually have the diagnosis? You know, prostate cancer, even diagnosis of prostate cancer involves in kind of invasive sampling techni techniques in as is difficult for men because sometimes the outcome greatly affects things like being able to pee normally mm -hmm. or a normal sexual function. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to just like go willy nilly into it. You want to, you really want to see what the risks and the benefits are. So you would really this, I mean, in this instance, you would really lean on, and I guess you could say the same thing in light of, of radiation risks right. with breast cancer. Right. I mean, these really, really are a first it's not just, you know, satisfy your own curiosity or right. your own morbid sort of, it's like, no, this is a real tool that could stave off a much, a much more difficult future. Right. And, and you don't have to necessarily jump to like something that's too aggressive. Right. Right. If, if that's not where your risk yeah. lands, right. you know? Wow. Um, and I think actually the best use of these because most providers, most family practice providers don't use this, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. If I if I said, well, what about the swap risk calculator in a meeting? Everybody would go, huh? Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, there'd probably be one old doctor in the corner who is <laughs> some you know, old Dutch maybe, guy in wood shoes. Yeah, going, ah. maybe had a better idea. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> but on the whole, I don't think a lot of physicians necessarily in family practice level spent a lot of time looking at this. We're required at United Indian Health to look at the American Heart Association. Mm -hmm. And I've yeah. experienced that one at, uh, at, at an exam at the at Open Door. Right. So that's the one that's most commonly mm -hmm. used. Mm -hmm. But what I would do, um, because I think this is super important as a patient, I would make an appointment with my provider solely for health maintenance. I wouldn't be trying to get the other 17 things I was concerned about, uh -huh. you know. But just um, for like... Okay. I would say, look, we're here. We're, you know, I understand my level of health right now. How do I keep it optimally managed? Uh -huh. And and have the entire visit be about, here's my risk for this disease, you know. And then here's my personal feelings about it. Like my risk or my concern about dementia as I age uh -huh. is off the charts because of my family history. Right. But maybe somebody else, you know, my, my concern about prostate cancer, not so much. Sure, okay. sure. Um, and my risk for breast cancer, or my concern about breast cancer, not as much as dementia. You know, and some people, having seen a parent perhaps get esophageal cancer or ovarian cancer, you know, that's their worst nightmare, right, and that's right. what they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to hit every single risk calculator. Um, all you really have to do is is address what keeps you up at night. Wow, I think. okay. Yeah, I think that, so that makes it, a, for me, an attractive tool. But there's other risk calculators that, that are more on the use of, um, you know, subspecialty, like, um, cancer doctors or maybe hospitalists um, or endocrinologists, for example. And these these are risk calculators that talk about like the risk of fracture with fall, you know, for elderly 
um, people. Osteoporosis is definitely a thing for women, should be more of a thing for men, mm -hmm. and falls oftentimes, especially hip fracture, is like the beginning of circling the drain, really. Yeah. So if we can modify somebody's risk for that, um, that would be super important. Post-surgical complication risk, which I thought was super cool. So you plug in, is this person who just had a you know three-way bypass, what's their risk for clot, mm -hmm. you know, pulmonary embolism, or stroke as a result of the procedure? And so that you can modify what you can in the beginning and be alert for what you can't. Right. So um, risk complications with COVID, like how likely is somebody to go on the vent? Wow. Yeah, which is still a thing, by the way. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And this, this is another one, even a financial one. How likely is this patient who is in the hospital, and I'm debating on whether they're stable enough to send home, how likely are they to be a bounce back? Mm -hmm. So what that means is somebody who's sent home too early. That's right. a hot topic in medicine. Oftentimes, patients feel like they are sent home too early, and they don't have the resources to take care of themselves, and they show up in the ER still sick. Wow. You know, a couple of days later, mm -hmm. that's a huge, big, like, slap on the wrist um, from Medicare. Right, right. Yeah. Sure, because they're trying to, to, to keep, quote-unquote, right. costs down, right? right. And so, exactly. okay, you're good enough to go home. Well, that, and they kind of want you to take care of the patient, you know? Wait, how do you talk? What are you talking about? Well, they don't want you to send somebody home who's who's still so sick that they need to still be in the hospital. Oh, okay. How's it yeah. a slap in the wrist for Medicare then? Because I took that the opposite of how you seem to have meant it. Um, is that you can? They'll modify for. Um, they'll they'll review charts and stuff. And if you have too many readmissions, then, then they'll go. Then okay, you get money see. taken away. Gotcha. Okay. Like clawed away. Wow. Like yeah. Clawed money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but um, I. I think this would be super cool if somebody wants to be proactive and, and try and get their health up. And it's more than a usual, you know, improve your diet, exercise more. I mean, you could get some specific information on this on what you need to do, like, say, yearly screening that might be a little bit out of the norm. So the next next thing is it's this is not really a risk calculator. Mm -hmm. It is a little bit. But a life insurance um, industry has calculators that you can use to see um, what your life expectancy is. Oh my God! And so think about it. That they need that for their business to sure. know who's a good risk and who isn't a good risk. I thought this was super fun to do. It's all um, <laughs> doesn't really require any big numbers or like what's your cholesterol, I your would... hemoglobin A one C. It's stuff like um, do you eat. How many fruits and vegetables do you eat on an average? How many servings? Like four to five, mm -hmm. like less than zero. <laughs> wow. You know? um, and things I want, like. I want to do this. Do you have a I, link? <laughs> you can, I just Googled it. But Google what? Life insurance? Yeah, life, insur uh, life expectancy calculator. Okay, because I also, I have also, while we've been speaking, I have just run through a three step prostate health uh, 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 calculator uh, that I have questions about for you because okay. it seemed like kind of okay. base and simple. So life expectancy, okay. Yeah, life expectancy. So one of the questions that was on the, the tool I was using was, do you use the seatbelt routinely? Uh -huh. And, um, you know, do you smoke? And they're super really easy yes or no questions. And so my life expectancy by that, which I don't believe for a second, and it is kind of alarming to me, <laughs> is 97. Is that's like, whoa. Yeah, so I feel like maybe I should, you know, not use the seatbelt all the time or something because I'm not certain that my brain's going to last that long. But Yeah, right, right. <clears throat> it's super interesting, I think. To, But the whole point of this I think the best use for the patient is that you you could say, look, this is what I want to strive for. If I want longevity and good health, this is what I'm going to strive for me personally. And then if you go in there and have a health maintenance visit, which I, outside of an annual physical exam, the way we did them 20 years ago, I don't really see this happening anymore. I wonder if it's even a billable encounter. Um, but you could have it like a to-do list for you, for the mm -hmm. patient, and then also maybe a to-do list or a greater understanding for the provider. So alerts can be put in your chart, you know, like high risk for fracture with osteoporosis. You know, the decision to start meds for osteoporosis is 
is not just yes or no. It's like when and which is the best medicine and how long you should be on it. So it, it gives the provider a deeper understanding of how to manage the patient for optimal health. Okay. And do not make this part of your routine, you know, your visit to talk about your low back pain because the provider will not pick up on the nuances that mm-hmm. they need to for this. That's interesting. Yeah. So in, it, this is kind of seems like counter to what we've said in the past about, mm-hmm. you know, being your own best advocate. In this regard, being your own best advocate, at least in this context, is almost like a higher level, you know, lower resolution sort of thing. Let's just look at everything. I don't need to right. drill down in any specific right. thing. What's the bigger picture? Yeah. 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 And I think that's good. I I think... Actually, if people did this, maybe on a yearly basis, it'd be interesting to see if they actually get the healthy longevity that they want. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So there's a study in here somewhere. But, um, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah That's there's interesting. Yeah. tons of tools. Like maybe your particular medical interest is, you know, like what keeps you up at night was watching your mom die of ovarian cancer, and you mm-hmm. want to avoid that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <clears throat> so even a man, I think... Um, you know, not having ovaries, you would think they wouldn't necessarily have ovarian cancer risk, but oftentimes BRCA genes are expressed in men as breast or colon cancer. Really? So it's bigger than you think. Yeah. And if you have a physician who's guiding you, I think you could get useful information where you least expect it. Mm-hmm. So. Okay, so I ran, I just did the, uh, I did, uh, I don't know, what is it? It's it's blueprintincome.com, mm-hmm. whatever this was, life expectancy calculator. Mm-hmm. came out with 88, which I'm super happy about. Because right. in my money, if I just hit 80, I win. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's kind of what I feel like. Because I, I see my parents at 87, and I'm like, oh, that's Do not, I want to be that? That's yeah. not so fun. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that made me feel good. I also had, I did this thing in the background, a, a prostate a cancer UK. So if okay. I were English, uh, and it only asked me three questions. Okay. And I'm not really sure I gained any sort of information from this that yeah, I couldn't have Yeah, that's not gained. a usable tool. Then. Right. So you didn't go to the Rotterdam one? No, 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 no. I, I went okay. now. I wanted because I wanted to, but it was like three questions. And it was just, are you, uh, do you have any, any African-American heritage? Because that's a okay. that's a risk fact. Uh, uh, are you over fifty? Okay. Uh, is there any family history? And there's no family history, no African American heritage. But I'm over fifty, and I got back. Oh, you're over fifty, so you've got a higher risk of prostate cancer because that's typically who gets affected by prostate cancer. Yeah. I'm going, this doesn't seem no. Helpful. You need a more sensitive tool, right? So the problem there is you also don't have any modifiable risk factors, and that's what you're really looking for. Well, what would be a modifiable risk factor for prostate cancer? Because it just when add- you start screening. What do you mean? So, so maybe you start screening at fifty, but maybe if you have a family history of it, you start screening at forty. I, you know, well, that's that's uh, like a how to. Maybe I should say that's more like a how to manage it better. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah maybe smoking is related. I don't think so, but it's that's not your risk factor anymore. Yeah, right. So yay. Um, <clears throat> And that'd be funny. I should go back and, and, and do the other one, the longevity one, and, and do it if I were still smoking. Because right. I'm coming up on a year now of not smoking. So so right. and that, that's not much. But the next, it was like, I, I, I just quit. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. It is. The, the, the numbers started like one to nine years. And I'm like, okay, yeah, it was one to nine years. But it seems like there's not, you know. So I don't know. I'm trying to find the Rotterdam one. <laughs> if you can, if you can go more than a year, then then the data tell us that you're you're statistically a non-smoker really yeah wow because the chance that you're gonna go back to Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. is much much less than say somebody who's gone six months right right or three weeks yeah 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 so you can claim the title i do have respect for uh any old person i see who's smoking i'm going right on (laughs) <laughs> does it matter if you're over 74 are you going to start you exactly. smoking again you're going to hand them out if you go to the doctor he'll give yeah, you a pack of luckies Here apparently you go. <laughs> i'm toast so <laughs> why not <laughs> i know i know people too have quit and quit for years and are getting older and you know what screw it i'm going to start smoking again right. and do that i'm like well, okay i i guess i guess i you know respect that as well because you, you you're playing it you're playing the system but uh but yeah, no, it does feel good. Less than less than a month, it'll be. It'll be actually a couple of weeks. It'll be. It'll be a year. Awesome. And uh, it's been very easy, and it was all because of gum. Anybody out there, you want to change that it's risk all about factor? The gum, guys. Get the the nicotine gum worked. And I was even like, and I thought, no, nah, there's no way it's not going to work. Uh, uh, I was talking with my daughter before I 
quit, who's a, who's a PhD, getting a PhD in neuroscience right now. And, and so, so she's basically the doctor in the family. We all right. ask her everything. Right. And I was saying, you know, I want to smoke, I want to stop smoking, but I can get through the initial like like physical withdrawal in the first couple of days, you know, just kind of grit through that. But it's the subsequent like psychological thing over the next few weeks that you know when when I would ordinarily have a cigarette. And she goes, "That's not psychological. That's physical still." Right. Chew the gum. Right. And she was absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, oh, Madeline, totally. for for hopefully Yay. getting me to eighty eight. So you have to take care of me. Strong work, Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. So so going in and 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 it it also seems like you said with the with the prostate uh, when you do like a health screening like that to realize that there's no personal real personal information i'm getting from that i'm i'm just sort of being plugged into the broadest statistical categories there yeah, yeah, are that's not the right calculator for right. you though there's a bunch of different ones yeah yeah so, so find the ones that ask you as for as much information as you can confidently supply right but not not ask you that doesn't ask you for things you wouldn't know where your doctor right would and then look it. at your risk mm -hmm. and what recommendations they might have so like I, I think recommendations would come out of any responsible calculator, mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. useful tool. Like maybe you want to start screening younger, or maybe you know, maybe your risk is so low, then why not screen every five years or something right, instead right. of every year? Um, and then play around with the toggle stuff back and forth. Yeah. And it, that's super interesting and also reinforcing um, for staying away from stuff that's bad. And you can get a little bit of a sense at how much each of these are weighted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, how like much those, they change. The one you did with three straightforward questions, mm -hmm. it, you know, the age, gonna... the age is apparently where the weight is, but that's too simplistic. Okay, so I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to change my smoking. I went back. And, and I'm going to change, I'm going to say, uh, we'll do still smoking. And I'm going to do it at half a pack a day, which is about what I was when I was smoking. So let's see what happens then. Calculate my life expectancy. Uh, before, it gave me a 75% chance of making it to 79. Right. And then and then a larger window. It brought five years off of it. It says 83. I have a 75% chance of reaching 75 if I were still smoking at half a pack a day. Right. The other thing is it doesn't really tell you what your quality of life is. Because I don't, right. I don't yeah. see you as that little guy pushing around the oxygen tank. Why not? You know? What? What kind of little old guy do I seem like to you? <laughs> like somebody who's hiking in the Boy Scout Oh, okay, trail good, good. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're, on, you're cool. So, I thought she's always Dr. But Strange I mean, love. what kind of quality of life do you want? <laughs> right, You know, right. That, that begs the question, too. Yeah, that's, so. wow. So, yeah, I'm going to have to, I want to, because I'm, I'm right at that age, man, where it's, it's, it's I'm, at the pro, I'm in the process of, like we talked last time, uh, or last year, it was last year already yeah i think it was with the with the numbers that i got back and lifestyle changes that i've that i've successfully enacted and changed i just went friday and got my next round of uh, of blood draw of, of labs coming so i'll see this week hopefully whether or not you know 27 pounds i've lost uh, changed all sorts of eating habits and uh it'll be interesting to see if that results in in lower stuff so yeah but right now i'm at the part okay well now i'll start going through the screening and and you know I would, how often would you recommend doing blood work like that? Assuming average risk. Yeah. So the answer to that changes yeah. with risk. Right, um, right. Like um, cholesterol and stuff. Yeah. Uh, hemoglobin A1C, um, yearly at least. Yearly. Okay, good. And and depending on your risk, you know, at, at UHS, because there's risk of diabetes in the native population, they, they screen like hemoglobin A1C, mm -hmm. which is a really easy test for sugars being too high. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they do that oftentimes quarterly. Wow. Just depending because on a person's more personalized risk. They have general risk for being native. Just an endemic yeah. risk for that. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, All yeah. Right. Well, uh, any thoughts about next week? Um, you know, I went to a meeting in Klamath this weekend, and I saw Dr. Reamer there, and I remembered that he was going to tell us about diabetes, so I'm mm -hmm. going to try and rope him in. Okay. Also, the hospice people in Del Norte, which also serves Brookings, mm -hmm. are interested in coming to talk to us, too. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see what comes of all of that. Lynn Zabo, as always, thank you, and we'll talk next week for the next Health Matters. Mm-hmm.